Now, I said that one of the most helpful insights we can have as we study movement is that there are some very basic generic principles that can help us to understand movement despite an enormous variation in the kinds of bodies that different animals have. Um, the slide illustrates uh, one such parallel, for example, it shows you the manner in which locomotion is achieved by a cheetah and an inchworm. Now they're radically different animals and they move at radically different speeds. But you can see that the physical principles underlying them are the same. That is, they both have long extended bodies, which they coil up. Then they lean forward with the top and extend the top until it makes contact. And then they coil back up. It's a kind of a spring that does this. Here's another plot from uh, an extensive study of quadruped gates in very, very many animals. The plot shows for many animals on the x-axis the percentage of the cycle that each foot is on the ground and the y-axis is the percentage of the cycle that the what is it the four footfall ooh, sorry the four footfall follows the hind footfall on the same side put those two together and you have an index that characterizes very many gates for very many animals, some with long legs, some with short legs. It includes both walks and runs. The horse appears there because the horse has several gates. The horse has several positions within this plot. But what it shows you is that it's an organized domain and that we can study locomotory patterns once we realize that they're all built from the same kind of stuff. They're all built from coupled oscillators in which the limbs go through their cycles not independently of each other, but with fixed phase relations. Here are some illustrative gates from all these, showing, for example, the a, a particular kind of gallop. There's a transverse gallop for the horse and a rotary gallop for the deer. There's a bound from a weasel, um, a bound from a mouse, and there's a pronk from a deer, a pronk. That's probably not one you ever heard of before. So here, just to prove the point, here are some pronks for you. Let's see if we can get some prongs there. There we go, there's a prong. You may have seen that in cartoons as well. Peppy Le Pew, the skunk um, prongs. So a given animal may have several gates at its disposal. That is, there's several ways in which it can bring all its limbs together and constrain their degrees of freedom in, in order to locomote. We saw with the hands, there was two ways to coordinate those, discrete ways, and you switch from one to the other. So when an animal has multiple gates at its disposal, one might think maybe they're just free to just choose one or choose the other, or you know, there might be no rhyme or reason to it all. But in fact, there's a great deal of rhyme or reason to it. Here's a lovely illustration that shows you how well a good graphic can communicate scientific uh, findings. Um, I'll have to walk you through this because there's a lot of information in this particular figure. Um, we're going to concentrate, first of all, on the top half. And we're going to note that this comes from an experiment done on three ponies, three small horses who were very docile and they were induced to walk, to trot, and to gallop at a range of rates on a treadmill with a big bag over their nose measuring their oxygen consumption. Not all horses will do this, so there are limits to what you can ask a pony to do, but these are very good ponies. And what you see on top are plots from the three conditions of walking, trotting, and galloping. Let's look at the walking data first. Those are the filled triangles. And they extend over a range of rates. So the x-axis here are different rates from slow on the left to faster on the right. And the y-axis is the amount of oxygen consumed per meter traveled. And you can see that we, these horses walked at a variety of rates and that the amount of oxygen that they consumed depended on the rate they walked at. Furthermore, you can see that there's one optimal rate for walking in which oxygen consumption is minimized if you walk more slowly or more quickly than that rate, then your oxygen consumption per meter traveled goes up. 
so much for walking. The trotting data are the open circles and they extend over a much broader range of rates. But we see the same basic picture, which is that if you trot slowly or you trot quickly, you're doing it inefficiently because you're using more oxygen than you have to. And that there is an optimal speed for trotting at, which is the minimum of that function. The data for the gallop, which are the third set on the top, the fill circles, they are not as clear because although there seems to be something similar going on and slow gallops are clearly inefficient, we don't have enough data to see the rise in inefficiency as we gallop at faster and faster rates. There are, after all, limits to what you can get a pony to do on a treadmill. But we see the same sort of thing, which is slow gallops are ineffective and there seems to be an optimal rate to gallop at. Now let's turn to the bottom half of the figure. Those black bars you see are counts. So look at the right hand y axis now and you see number of observations. These are counts of observations of these same horses when they were let out into the paddock and allowed to do whatever they wanted to do. They're allowed to walk, trot or gallop as they wanted to. And what was observed was, well, if they're trotting, what speed do they choose to trot at? Or what speed do they trot at? What speed do they actually gallop at? And you can see that the speeds at which they are observed to walk, trot and gallop in the wild are the same ones picked out by the carefully controlled experiment as being optimal in terms of oxygen consumption. So there's a great deal of regularity to the gates adopted by horses. This is presumably something similar is going to be true for all gates of all animals. And you might think then that the horse has been, as it were, tinkered or designed by evolution to walk, trot and gallop in order to minimize oxygen consumption. That's partially true. It's not quite true because Another study a couple of years later looked at a completely different variable. It looked at hoof strain. When a hoof meets the ground, it comes under a degree of strain. And the kind of strain it comes under depends on whether you're walking, trotting or galloping and what speed you're doing it at. And it turns out you can minimize hoof strain by walking, trotting or galloping at a, at a particular speed. And it's the same speed that you found in this experiment. So the horse is optimal not just for oxygen consumption, but also for hoof strain and also probably for a thousand other variables because evolution doesn't work by minimizing one function. In evolution is a tinkerer adjusting all kinds of things all at once. A horse simply is an optimal kind of animal. All animals are optimal kinds of animals. So there's a great deal of regularity here. Um, that regularity, we didn't have to appeal to the brain there. What we're looking at is the manner in which the entire body is brought into the service of the behavioral goal, which is here getting around. Um, and we can exaggerate the role of the brain. In fact, what I'm trying to do is downplay the role of the brain. The brain is important in getting an animal to walk, but so is the body, I said, and so is the environment. So is the, you couldn't walk without the ground to walk on. If I suspend you in the deep end of a swimming pool and say, show me you're walking now, your legs will make movements, but they won't be walking movements because you don't have a base of support. We can see how the body as a whole organizes itself in locomotion from these slightly creepy experiments done in the Soviet Union in the 1960s. Schick, Orlovsky and Severin did some experiments on what they called a mesencephalic cat. This was a cat in whom the connection between the higher motor cortices, the higher cerebral cortex, and the rest of the body had been severed, leaving them effectively paralyzed. So there's no sense in which these cats can conduct voluntary movement. And they can't even stand up. So the illustration shown there is inaccurate because it leaves out a belt suspended under the tummy of the cat holding it up as they're then put on a treadmill but the astonishing thing is here with no input from the cerebral cortex which normally we associate with voluntary movement these cats self or their bodies self-organize into a gait in which the limbs have a gait-like arrangement the one leg is organized with respect to the other leg with fixed phase relationships you can see those time traces, regular time traces, show you that the legs are regularly organized. And furthermore, the relative phase, that is the phase of one leg compared to the other leg is shown at the bottom as the rate on the treadmill is turned up. And what you find is a switch 
from one form of organization to another form of, of organization. So we had a switch from this form of organization to this form of organization. Here's a rate induced switch from a poor, must be said, a poor walk to a poor trot of some sort in these cats. Now these gates are not normal. The brain is very important in walking, but it's not controlling the body and telling it what to do. So here in these cases, the change was induced simply by changing the rate, which is a very non-specific thing to change. And the whole organization of the body switches from one form to the other with no higher brain involvement at all. In a rather clever experiment, Scott Kelso, who gave us this paradigm, invented this chair, which turned his graduate students into quadrupeds. So you strap a graduate student or a postdoctoral researcher into a chair like this, and you attach their four limbs and suddenly they are quadrupeds and you can vary the relative weight of each limb, the mass of each limb by attaching weights. And like you or I, these students, these volunteers did not have any experience of being quadrupeds. But when they were constrained to act as quadrupeds, what you find is immediately they, their limbs self-organize into, in this case, four distinct patterns. And once more, there are rate dependent changes in organization from one pattern to the other. So at low speeds, all four patterns are available. But as we speed up and the bound turns into a jump and the trot turns into a pace, I think I may have that the wrong way around. But there's rate dependent transitions there. And to illustrate the same basic notion, and I hope you can see it's the same basic notion. Here's a ghastly experiment which you are not to do. But if you were to remove the pairs of legs on a caterpillar or a centipede or a millipede, these animals of very little brain don't stop walking and they don't have a learning period in which they learn to walk with an unfamiliar number of legs. They Im immediately self-organize into a smooth, fluent, coordinated movement, just as before, until the number of legs gets absolutely ridiculously low. So there's no sense in which the brain has to learn how to control the body, the new, this entirely new number of legs, the brain and body, the body as a whole self-organizes. So these, the study of the basic physical organizing principles that are involved in movement changes our view of what the brain is involved and the notion of coordination emerges as much more important than the notion of control.